Thank you. Um, uh, All right, folks, let's get started. Welcome everyone to the uh, IETF 118 Key Transparency. It's our first session. Um, a reminder, this is a recorded session. Um, so if you don't want to be recorded, make sure you're not visible to the camera or you don't speak. Um, Oh. No, no, no. Maybe broadcast projector. Oh. Right. So it seems our projector in the room is not projecting behind me, which I haven't turned around since I sat down, so I didn't notice. <laughs> If anyone from the Meet Echo or staff is monitoring this channel, please. Thank you. While we wait, um, Roman and Paul, if you'd like to you know, say anything at the mic, since this is our first session, you're welcome to take, make use of the time as much as you want. Dance. I, exactly. I, I can talk for as long as I want. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone, and good evening and good afternoon for those that are remote. Uh, this is our, the first time we're getting together, so I wanted to really congratulate the proponents and all those that had feedback I through the through the BOF and on the mailing list that got us to this point. So we have a fully chartered working group. So it got a really wonderful. I, I was so pleased to see kind of all the energy and the interest in, in this topic. And so we are convening. And the other piece I wanted to mention is thank you to both Ori and Siobhan, who have stood up to kind of lead us and facilitate this conversation for us. So you, we really appreciate your willingness to willingness to serve here. Thank you. We saw the projector LED blink. Let it warm up.
So for folks who are entering the room, we're setting up the projector and we'll be with you shortly. As we wait, um, the slide that I'm looking at, oh, excellent. Thank you. All right. Um, for, for me, the, I've been looking at the note well for some time. Um, uh, but since you're now just seeing it on the screen, a reminder um, uh, to review all of the relevant uh, policy documents. Uh, ensure your contributions are consistent with the note well. And um, if you're not familiar with the note well, perhaps you leave the room, become familiar with it before you contribute anything here. Uh, the note really well. Um, so a reminder uh, to conduct, conduct yourself um, with professionalism, uh, familiar, familiarize yourself with our code of conduct um, and if you experience any communication you feel uncomfortable with, um, follow our processes and procedures, please. Um, we wanna make sure all of the communication and engagement um, in, this, in this working group is consistent with uh, the highest quality of communication the IETF can offer. So as I said at the beginning, um, this session is recorded. Um, make sure to sign the blue sheets. Uh, this is a wonderfully beautiful room with lots of space. The next one may not be this large, so please ensure you've signed in um, using the on-site tool or by scanning the uh, blue sheets. Uh, um, uh, Siobhan, would you mind uh, uh, hiding your video for one sec so that we can have sure. the QR code where your face is. <laughs> sure. There's, there's no clipboard up here. Um, but there should be a QR code at the mic line. There's one right here where I'm standing. Yep. So you can scan the QR code at the mic line or this. Or you can click the on-site tool in the agenda. And indeed, that's that's also what's on the slide here. Um, if you're remote, uh, please keep your video and audio off unless you're presenting. Um, and uh, just lost the, our slides for a sec. Second. I think I may have disconnected. Apologies, my laptop just disconnected. All right, and we're back. 
All right, and uh, if you're remote, um, uh, the use of a headset is uh, highly required or recommended. All right, um, just a brief overview. Uh, as this is our first session, um, we have our agenda, um, the preparation meeting minutes, links, uh, all of this is for you if you're interested in these after the meeting. Okay, um, we have a, a relatively short agenda for uh, today's session. Um, we'll have a problem statement from Brendan McMillan in, in a moment, an architecture overview uh, from Brendan, uh, some, a presentation from Esha Ghosh on security properties of key transparency and, a privacy, and the privacy properties of key transparency from Kevin Louie. Is there a password we'll control? Play. Yep, yeah. we're ready to go. Uh, and I pass over control to you, Brendan. Uh, cool, thank you so much. Uh, so this is going to be basically an updated version of uh, the same presentation I gave at IETF 116. Uh, for the problem statement, just to remind people what we are working on. So right now, when people build into an encrypted services, there are a lot of really good options for how to encrypt data, but kind of what there famously is not is a good way to distribute public keys. Um, for those encryption algorithms. Uh, if you take basically any secure messaging app and you dissect it, what you'll find is that inside there is an internal directory that stores a mapping from um, user identities to the user public keys. Uh, and that directory is not really secured in any way. The security of it relies completely on um, trusting the service to operate correctly, which is not great because um, if you trust the service to be honest all of the time, it kind of calls into question why you're using encryption in the first place. Because an honest server would not miss user messages, but if the server is not honest, then it can bypass the encryption really easily by just giving you the wrong public key to encrypt your data to. Um, and then it can read your messages that way. And of course the trick is if the server gives you the wrong public key so that it can read your messages, um, that does technically require some action on the server's part that could be detected, um, but realistically, you're very, very unlikely to ever actually detect it. Apps will give you um, these screens that you can use to manually verify the public keys of the people that you communicate with. Um, but in all of my time being surrounded by people who care a lot about computer security, uh, I think that I've only ever done that twice. And in those two cases, it was because I was talking about key transparency. Um, so it's very, very unused. Um, and this is a big problem because without trustworthy key management, it's not possible to have trustworthy encryption. Um, so the, the technical solution to this key management problem is something called key transparency. From the, the BOF request, uh, key transparency is a safe, publicly auditable way to distribute cryptographically sensitive data like public keys. Uh, and the abstraction to think about here uh, that KT follows is basically a key value database. And so you've got a key value database and you have two main cryptographically assured properties about the data in that database. Uh, the first and the most important one uh, is number one, which is that Alice's key as seen by Alice is the same as Alice's key as seen by everybody else. Uh, or another way to say that is that everyone has the same view of data. And the reason this is important is because it lets you go from um, a world where users manually verify that public keys belong to specific real life people to a world where uh, a user's devices can monitor their own account for unexpected changes that could be impersonation. Uh, Brendan, um, one, one moment as a chair to interrupt. I, I failed to ask for uh, scribes for this meeting. So I'm just now rem remembering we had at least one volunteer to take notes. Uh, do we have any other volunteers who'd be willing to help capture what very important things Brendan is saying for our minutes? Apologies, Brendan, that's, that's my fault. Anyone in the room? Anyone remote? Uh, Tibalt, thank you uh, for volunteering. Um, and thank you for capturing, hopefully, the beginning part of this. 
anyone would like to back him up, uh, please uh, use the note taking tool. And since we have at least one note taker, I'm gonna proceed now since we've already had Brendan uh, dive in. Go ahead, Brendan. Thank you. Um, so what I was saying is that the key transparency approach is that users' devices can monitor their own accounts for unexpected changes. They could be impersonation. Um, and the example that I normally use to talk about this is if you think about what happens when you log into Gmail or Facebook, uh, you get an email saying that someone logged in as you. And if it was really you, you just kind of ignore the email, um, which is what makes logical sense to do in this scenario. Uh, and it's the model that KT allows you to follow with encryption. Um, but versus this is kind of, instead of what we currently do, um, is the opposite of what I just said. Uh, so instead of telling you that someone new logged in as you, we tell everyone else that someone logged in as you, um, which doesn't make sense because uh, the people that you communicate with are not equipped to do anything with that information. Um, they don't know or care if you got a new device or if your old device got lost or whatever, um, that is kind of the responsibility that's on you. Uh, so KT gives you the ability to um, use this consensus property to monitor your own device for changes like that. And then the second property that you get is that Alice's key today is the same as Alice's key yesterday, plus anything new. And the reason for that is just so that Alice can go offline for a while and then come back and see that um, nothing happened while she was gone. So uh, you might be thinking, this all sounds great, but why are you telling me? Like, why does the IETF need to be involved in this problem? Um, so despite uh, how important the problem is of providing trustworthy key management for encryption, um, and despite the fact that KT is a relatively perfect fit to solve this problem, KT has never really been seriously adopted. And so you wanna ask yourself, uh, why is that? And there's a number of reasons. Uh, the first is that KT tends to be very technically complicated. Uh, there's a relatively large amount of academic literature in the space, and there's not much guidance on what the kind of right design choices are versus just what's possible. Um, there are also very few implementations and those that exist are often kind of uh, missing important parts or they're unmaintained. Um, and actually something that people pointed out at the last meeting, uh, which was a really good point, is that the technical difficulties are all combined with the reputational consequences for getting a KT deployment wrong. So if you think about um, sitting down and trying to justify to like a product person why you should, why you should deploy KT, uh, they're going to think through it and they're going to say, well, okay, the best case scenario from doing this is that our product looks and acts exactly the same as it did before. Uh, maybe we get like a blog post out of it, but generally nothing is going to change. And the worst case scenario is that like a year from now, there's going to be some pop-up that says, you know, our company is compromised and um, the sky is falling and it's going to scare people and I don't want to deal with that. So uh, you've got really severe reputational consequences to a KT deployment possibly failing. Um, and in terms of security products, KT is not necessarily unique in that way um, or in having, uh, or in being technically complicated either, but combined together, that causes the, the prospects for a KT deployment to be relatively bleak. Um, so the ideal end goal here is that we would have a standard um, and this, it would be a standard that would be able to have uh, a lot of positive impact because it would pretty well address a lot of the barriers to deployment that I was talking about in the last slide. Um, so if you have a standard, sort of widely applicable protocol description that feeds into, uh, it feeds into building industry consensus around what KT is supposed to look like and it helps you figure out the correct choices in the design space. Um, and then once you figure that out, you can get a protocol description that uh, would get a decent level of scrutiny from security researchers and from the general public. Uh, once you have that, you can have trustworthy and complete open source implementations that people can actually implement it and know that it's gonna be secure. And once you have implementations, that kind of comes naturally with better documentation and more people that are exposed to KT and using it. Um, because people are deploying it, you have a better understanding of the issues that actually come from deploying KT. Uh, so in terms of actually getting to a standard for this problem, um, 
IETF 116, uh, which happened earlier this year, that, that was our BOF session. We had several presentations from people who were deploying KT or working on KT generally. And the purpose of that was uh, number one, just to get a broader sense of what people in the space were working on and what was possible. But also beyond that, to show that um, despite the fact that these people were working independently uh, on kind of the same problem, they were coming to similar enough conclusions about what makes sense for solving their problem that a standard would be feasible. Um, so since the bot happened, it was very successful. And the stuff that comes after that is actually aligning that community on a set of common and achievable requirements, which is where we are now. Um, that kind of partially happened in the the charter negotiations that happened in the interim between the BOF and this meeting. So there are some, some architectural requirements which have gotten uh, baked into the charter, but also most of the session is going to be going through the, uh, the architecture document, which was shared on the mailing list last month uh, and trying to build kind of consensus around that and also what's gonna go into it in the future. Um, yeah, so that's the process for getting there. To dig a little bit further into the, the charter requirements um, since we've been chartered. Uh, so one change that we made from early versions of the charter was we switched from talking about a service provider to talking about an authentication service. Um, so early versions of the charter were written in a very like centralized service mindset. And since then we've changed it to referring to kind of an abstract authentication service. And the purpose of that is to uh, open the door to supporting federation. Uh, in terms of the requirements that we would put on the authentication service, uh, the first one is that it has to be transparent, which is kind of obvious from the name key transparency. Uh, the second one is that it would be user friendly. So there would be little or no awareness of the system um, in the sense that like, we're not going to assume that users are gonna be out like scanning QR codes. Like we can provide the ability for them to do that if they would like to, but that's not going to be a critical part of the security story. Like the QR code scanning should be really like an optional fun thing that you do with your friends. Um, beyond that, it should be private. So information about users in the system should only ever be revealed to people who are authorized to know about that user. Um, and the important thing to point out is that that's a baseline requirement. Like we can't do less than that, but we will almost certainly do more than that as, um, as the protocol actually gets fleshed out. And then finally, it should be efficient. So it's practical to deploy. It would be uh, nice if we were able to deploy the protocol. And for the film statement, that is all I have. Are there any thoughts? Awesome. Uh, thank you, Brandon. Um, we're gonna uh, target about five minutes of comments and response on this. Um, if you have any comments or questions, uh, please feel free to enter the queue. Hi, uh, this is Daniel Gilmore. Thank you for working on this. This is a, a long missing piece of the infrastructure, so I'm glad to see it. Um, can you bring the previous slide back? Uh, yeah. Um, so this is great. Uh, and I like that privacy is one of the top level design requirements. But I see this as privacy, as stated here, it looks like it's privacy for the key holder. And one of the things about directories of identity information is that if you get to know who's looking who up, you can violate the privacy of the correspondent to the key holder. And I'm wondering whether that's also in scope. Does that make sense? Like if I'm writing to you and I look it up and I have to go to the key transparency service and say, I wanna find Brendan McMillan's key, and it says, I'm not gonna give you Brendan McMillan's key unless you can prove that you're authorized to do so. And it does that by finding out who I am. It now knows everyone who wants to talk to you. So your privacy has been protected in some sense there, but it's also been violated and mine because now they know that I wanna to talk to you, right? It means that the, that the key transparency service can build a map of relationships between users. So I wonder if that privacy, uh, in terms of refining that privacy, target, we shouldn't think also about the privacy of the people who are looking things up in key transparency. Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Um, it's kind of unfortunate that when we were working on the charter, I had in my mind the idea of um, uh, a, 
an application where the contact graph or the the social graph was not secret from the service. Uh, so that's not something that got put into the charter, but it is something that uh, I think would absolutely be valuable to work on and try to include in the protocol. Hi, Dimitri Zagadulin, MIT DCC. Uh, question for, for the chairs and the presenter. So, so far the emphasis has been more on the key directory, uh, but, but traditionally key transparency uh, also records uh, key rotation events. So my question is, would, it be in would this be useful to record something like key rotation events for a JWK key set or similar? Um, I think that that would definitely be a, a good application of it. Um, I would need to read the charter more closely to see if that's something that fits immediately into the charter because the charter is written um, from the perspective of uh, like chat services and supporting them and solving that problem. PHP? Hi, Phil Hambaker. Yeah, uh, just responding to DKG. Uh, yeah, I think that we want the, pri the privacy to be a bit stronger uh, in that we want to minimize the information exchanged. I'm not sure that we want to put preventing mapping the con communication graph as out of scope for KT because I've looked into ways of doing that. And in my system, I do have a very strong proof but it is outside the key t KT piece in that what, the, what I throw into KT is, you know, hashes of signatures and blobs. So there's really very little information in there. But if you make that privacy requirement too high, then you end up with uh, tying yourself in knots that you probably don't want to do. So I, I, I'd, I'd suggest weasel language. So uh, make it as privacy as possible, but not tie yourself down too far. Thanks. Roman. Hi, Roman Dinelli with AD. Uh, I'm shooting from the hip here because there was a charter kind of scoping question. Uh, so at the level of abstraction that I just pulled up the charter, kind of quickly looked at it, and I heard a proposal would JWKs be kind of in scope. Uh, I would say the big answer is it depends. What we have scoped ourselves for is to solve solve things in the space of end-to-end -end encryption communication services. And Brent is exactly right. Colloquially, we said that's things like video conferencing services and instant messaging kind of providers. So if JWKs, which are a solution, uh, are kind of in scope for that use case, maybe, uh, but I don't think we're scoping our use case as you know, bound to a particular kind of technology. But you know, I think the details matter here. Thanks. Um, my recollection from the discussions on the mailing list, you know, prior to sort of finishing the, the icing on the charter was that the various different key expressions could be supported and that this would not be limited to only one uh, key serialization. But uh, I'm not, I'm not making that, you know, uh, absolutely. That is uh, sort of the point about key serialization. I think we had a little bit of a robust thread on like, let's not lock ourselves in at chartering time, but now we're in a different place kind of in the working group. I mean, we can certainly make, make those decisions, but it sounded like folks wanted flexibility is what I heard. Yep. All okay. right. Um, I think right. that's us move on. All right, Brendan, you're going to be up again in a second. So, all right, whenever you're ready. Okay, cool. So the the first milestone that we have as a working group is to adopt an architecture document. Uh, for people that are are newer to the IETF, the purpose of an architecture document is to to find the, the terminology that's going to be used in a protocol, and it also defines the the parties that are in the protocol and how they interact together. Uh, 
I believe the older term that used to be used to describe this is an applicability statement because you would be able to um, read it and understand if a protocol is applicable to your problem. Um, so what it explicitly doesn't do is say anything about how the protocol actually works. There's no algorithms or message formats. It's all relatively um, just high level pieces fitting together. Uh, and in terms of what it means to adopt a document, adopting a document just means uh, taking it from the individual who wrote it and putting it in the care of the working group. So the biggest implication of doing that is that it would no longer be just uh, my personal decision how to change the draft and what goes in it. Um, if we're gonna do changes to the drafts that are substantial, you would wanna see uh, evidence of working group consensus behind those changes before they're actually made. Um, so uh, that's what it means to adopt a draft. Uh, in terms of actually doing that milestone, uh, I shared a document with the mailing list about a month ago, uh, which I'm going to describe to you now. So the, the first section is parts of the draft that people seem fine with, in the sense that the draft discussed these topics pretty clearly and nobody complained about them. So I'm assuming they're fine. Uh, so this is uh, the same slide I used at IETF 116 describing the, the basic operational model for KT. Uh, and what you have is a protocol between a client and a server, which uh, is basically uh, a key value database interaction. So users can do search requests to look up the value of a key. They can do update requests to change the value of a key, or they can do monitor requests to uh, look specifically for changes to keys that they care about. Um, if users try to look up a key that they're not allowed to, or they try to change it in a way that they're not allowed to, those requests can kind of just be blocked without any further consideration. And the reason for that is that the draft uh, does not specify a transport layer. So um, the assumption is that all of the, the request and the response payloads are carried inside of a higher level sort of application protocol that will handle authentication and access control and rate limits and all of that stuff. So we don't have to, which is quite nice. Um, and also the assumption is that users should generally only need direct communication with the transparency log. Um, that partially goes back to the constraint in the charter, which is that uh, there should be little or no user awareness of the system. So we're not requiring users to scan QR codes, like I said. Um, but it's actually slightly stronger than that because it's saying that clients can, uh, for the most part, stick to a really simple uh, client server request response kind of operating mode, which is uh, definitely a really nice simplification. So um, while clients can stick to the kind of client server model, is not necessarily that simple for servers. And the reason for that is because uh, it's possible to make QT protocols a lot more efficient by bringing in uh, a semi-trusted kind of third party. And the, the problem there is that it's not always so easy to actually find a third party that you like and that you want to involve really deeply in your application. Um, so what the draft does is it supports three different deployment modes. The first one is called contact monitoring and, and it has no third party. Um, and the consequence of having no third party is that uh, everybody has to do slightly more work to make up for the third party that does not exist. Um, and then the other two, third party auditing and third party management, as the names imply, have a third party, uh, which is involved in slightly different ways. Um, and I also put here some examples of applications that generally follow the deployment mode to kind of, um, uh, I guess, exemplify how they're supposed to work. Uh, so Google published a KT implementation a few years ago, and Apple also really recently announced that they are adding KT to iMessage. Um, in both of these cases, they used uh, a single party implementation. So they are probably more of a contact monitoring kind of mode. Um, WhatsApp, on the other hand, has been pursuing having a trusted third party in more of an auditor position. Um, and then for third party management, uh, the examples that I put were certificate transparency and culture certificates, which are not great examples because they're not uh, chat applications, um, but I will try to explain that in a few slides. So um, to dig a little bit deeper into how each of the deployment modes work, uh, this is contact monitoring because there is no auditor or third party to ensure that every change the log makes uh, is being done correctly, that responsibility falls on the users instead. 
So whenever a user looks at the key for someone they want to talk to, they have to remember some information about uh, what, what they were shown by the server. And then in the future, on a recurring basis, they will keep checking in with, with the server and verifying that what they were shown previously is still there. Um, and so the reason that works um, sort of intuitively is you think about if the log adds a malicious entry and then it shows it to someone, um, then either the service can try to remove that entry at some later point, in which case the person that got shown it will notice and be mad, or it can not remove the malicious entry, in which case the person who owns that account will see that it was added and get mad. Um, so someone will get mad, you just get to choose who. Um, so that's kind of the, the security basis for it. Then the, the next one is third-party auditing. Um, in this case, you have an auditor whose job is basically to get upset for everyone else. So users don't have to do that um, sort of recurring check-in with the log. Uh, they can assume that what they get is usually authentic. So in this case, the transparency log does all of the work of uh, actually running the protocol, running the server, uh, communicating with users. And what it will do is it will, on a recurring basis, check in with an auditor. So as part of that checking in, um, the log shows the auditor all of the changes that it made to the database. And the auditor checks that those changes were applied correctly. And if they were, the auditor produces a little signature that's kind of like a, a seal of approval. Um, and then the, the transparency log kind of can take that signature and show it to its users as a sign that it's behaving honestly. So if the log ever does do something malicious, then the auditor will um, be upset, as we've discussed, and refuse to provide its signature. And without that signature, users will know to stop trusting the log because it's done something bad. And then the third one is third-party management. Um, so now you've got a, a manager on the right side who does all of the work of actually running and hosting the KT server. Whereas the transparency log here is really just forwarding requests from users to the manager uh, and enforcing uh, access control policies. So the manager just runs the log. It doesn't know what's authentic and what's supposed to go in the log. Um, the transparency log is not actually holding any data, but it knows the rules for what's allowed and what's not. Um, so the reason that I gave CT as an example of this is because you can kind of think of the transparency log as more of a, a certificate authority. And then the manager is more like a CT log. Um, so in the WebPKI, when users want to issue a new certificate, their request goes to a CA. And the CA does all of the work to actually decide uh, if it should approve the issuance request or not. And if it does, it signs it by creating a pre-certificate. And that pre-certificate gets sent to uh, a CT log, which is more like a manager, uh, to produce an SET. And then the SET comes back to the CA which builds uh, a full certificate and then gives that back to the user. So it's kind of, it's kind of meant to be the same idea. Um, the log is just enforcing access control and uh, the manager is the one who actually keeps the state of the system. Um, but yeah, those are the three deployment modes. The, the next important part of the draft is about uh, out of band communication. And there are two ways that we talk about to do it. So um, the purpose, first of all, of out of band communication is to detect forks, because if you only ever interact with the one server, it's really easy for the server to present you uh, a view of data, which is different from what it's shown everyone else, but which is also internally consistent. So um, you would not be able to tell that anything was wrong, but you would, uh, have different data from anyone else. So uh, the two ways that are described, the first one is peer-to-peer -peer gossip. This is basically just the normal QR code scanning approach where two users are physically together. Uh, they want to ensure the devices are consistent. And so they are scanning things on their phone. Um, going to important point number one, um, the difference between QR code scanning in an app that uses KT and an app that does not is that in an app that uses KT, uh, what you're gossiping with this QR code would be information about a tree head versus uh, individual public keys. Uh, so the reason that you would do that, of course, is that it makes sense, or 
it makes it possible for users who are not contacts to still gossip together. Uh, or even if they are contacts, gossiping treeheads proves consistency over all of the contacts that they both have, whether those contacts are shared or not. Um, and it's also able to cover things that have happened in the past. So by uh, comparing that you have the same tree head, you sort of are checking that you have the same view of all of space and time for this application. Um, whereas if you gossip individual public keys, that would only prove consistency for uh, a single chat session. So it's a, a much weaker guarantee. And then the second way that we describe for out-of-band communication is by using anonymous channels. And the idea here is basically just that users would be able to fetch tree heads uh, over an anonymous network. And this is really nice because it does the exact same thing actually as peer-to-peer -peer gossip, but it is capable of being automated. So going back to the charter, it's uh, you've got the mandate to be user-friendly and the fact that this is automated um, is very nice. The users don't have to do anything. Um, yeah, and the second important point is that gossiping effectively requires having what's called a linearizable view, which is what we're gonna cover in the next slide. So uh, this concept of a linearizable view um, is probably what the draft mentions the least explicitly, but the idea is that it requires users to remember the most recent tree head they've observed uh, and check that future queries are provably consistent against that tree head. So anytime the user interacts with the server and the server needs to present uh, a newer tree head, what it will do is it will also provide a consistency proof uh, relative to the previous tree head that it showed that user. And the consistency proof uh, would show that this new tree head, which is being used, contains all the same entries as the previous tree head, plus some new tree, some, some new entries. So uh, we have a guarantee that nothing was removed. And we kind of always maintain this guarantee going forward. As time goes on, we continue making sure that nothing is ever removed from the tree. So the biggest implication of this decision is that uh, it requires clients to keep state. Uh, and that state is the tree head. So tree heads are like relatively small and it's a constant size amount of state, but still it would not be possible to have uh, stateless clients. Uh, the benefit that you get from doing this though is that it makes the out-of-band communication much more effective than I was talking about from the last slide. Uh, and the reason that you do that is because it creates a really strong guarantee that you've never been shown a fork. If you are ensuring, if you are ensuring that every time you see a new tree head, it's an extension of a previous tree head. If you get shown a tree head ever, then it's never possible to get you back on the same view as everyone else. So all it takes is uh, the server to misbehave once for that to be detectable for the rest of time, which is a very powerful guarantee. Um, yeah, and it, it helps you ensure when you gossip that you are um, coming to consensus on all of the current state of the application and all of the past states as well. Uh, and the second benefit is that in the third party auditing mode, uh, having this linearizable view actually allows you to have immediate updates despite potentially the auditor being somewhat far behind. Uh, and the reason for that is that um, as a client, if you ensure that you're always on the same view, then you can accept data from parts of the tree that have potentially not been audited yet because you have a guarantee that they will eventually be audited um, or they won't. And that will be detectable because you will see that the auditor has stopped signing the same version of the tree that you were on. So yeah, um, that is all of the parts of the draft that I feel like people are probably fine with based on um, just mailing list feedback. But I wanted to stop and briefly ask uh, in terms of what I've talked about so far, not, not, like, not like things that are missing, but what I've talked about so far um, are there objections? Okay, Pete. Yeah, hi. Thanks for the presentation, Brendan. So, um, I'm a, I really liked your presentation, and I think uh, the architecture document is a great start. So, I'm definitely not against adoption. 
I would put maybe slight remarks to towards the whether I have no objections. But the interesting thing is I had more objections with the document and less with the way how you presented it. Um, so uh, I, I find, um, I think what you meant by linearizable view is something that I would uh, intuitively also describe as you need to decide how much the lock should be append only, right? Because there are different notions of append only. In some trees, you can rewrite leaves and then you append only with respect to a list of operations that you have on the side as well. Um, and I'd also put what you discussed here as out of band communication more into focus, but you could say that this is a bit of an editorial uh, decision. You, you have these three actions saying, uh, look up, uh, I don't remember the three, right? But look up, monitor, search, these things. I would really put this getting a consistent view of the log as a fourth of these central things that need to be specced out. I've in the draft currently, I find it reads a bit like, um, yeah, and, and then also logs should provide a way to, uh, to obtain a consistent view on the tree heads. Uh, but yeah. As I said, I think my issues are more with uh, how it's written, and I found your presentation to address these things well. Thank you. I actually wanted to ask you about that. You said um, there's different notions of linearizability. Uh, my understanding, or basically every system that I'm, I'm familiar with that implements this, puts all of the data in a single uh, linear order. The difference is with something like, I guess, CT. Uh, CT logs have the right to take, I think, 24 hours to like take a big batch of stuff. And then um, they can kind of build a big batch of stuff and then they put it all into a line. But everything eventually gets put into a line. Uh, I, I unfortunately didn't have time to read all the papers in detail, but my understanding was that there are designs where you allow to really rewrite the tree. So where you take an old leaf and you just do change it to something else. And then auditors just need to do a lot of work to check that the new tree actually only contains these updates and no else. So you really okay. lose this, you really lose this one, the, the old tree is a subtree of the new tree. There are designs that lose this property, which makes auditing much more costly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Rowan, you're next. Hi, Rowan May. Hey, um, so um, this is not particularly an objection to ad adoption, but uh, more of a, a, a question that I think we need to answer at the same time as we adopt. Um, and it's, <clears throat> it's about the requirements. So we've got, obviously, you know, we've got the three different deployment modes, two of which have been used in the wild by real, uh, you know, re large, large customers at the same scale using this for, the, for sub substantively the same application of instant messaging uh, that have chosen different deployment modes. And we have, you know, a lot of the sort of privacy related questions are, well, do you get this property? Do you get this property? Do you get this property? And so um, I was hoping to see a stronger, um, stronger discussion of, <clears throat> These are the requirements that we absolutely are, like, we're going to ensure that all of these requirements are met for any protocol or any, you know, any best current practice uh, in Keytrans. These are the ones that we think are, are optional and that this is why somebody might choose one or the other based on their either operational needs or the, you know, the, the vendor chooses different sets of privacy to suit different end users or different, you know, customers, whatever that means. Uh, sorry. Uh, do you, Br Brendan, do you want to come on on that for a minute or maybe? So your, your, your comment is that we should clearly delineate the security guarantees that a key transparency protocol would provide to an application. Well, uh, that we should say which, which security, yeah. which security requirements and which you know, operational requirements we have, that are mandatory, 
and which ones are optional. Because if we go to develop a protocol and we have an architecture and it says, yeah, you could do, you know, you could do, here are three models. You could, you know, people do this, mm -hmm. people do that, people do the other thing. And then we start developing a protocol and some of the things are useful for two of the, you know, one and a half of the deployment models, then that's a recipe for us to trip over ourselves later in the process. Yep. So as I understand it, you're saying it's difficult to reason about the security properties if, if we don't, um, if we aren't clear on this point. Uh, among other things. I mean, yeah. there, there are a variety of other problems that occur later in the game when you realize like, oh, wait, yeah, well, that's a requirement. Oh, wait, is it? Well, wh where does it say that it's a requirement? We, we, we suffered from this in big time in, you know, in SIP, for example, and that was like, <laughs> uh, yeah. Thanks. I believe there is already a subsection of the architecture draft called security sections or called security considerations that didn't make it into um, the, the presentation. But it basically does do what you said, which is it says, we provide this guarantee, we provide this guarantee, we provide this guarantee. Um, you know, in the case that you use this deployment mode, then your security depends sort of slightly, subtly on, you know, non-collusion with an auditor or something, right? Um, to do, specify the rest of the privacy guarantees of the finished protocol. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure it says there's a security um, consideration just, section. Yeah, right. security guarantees. Okay. That was a quote from the privacy guarantee section of the architecture document, right. by the way, for sure. those who haven't read it. Siobhan, go ahead. Yeah, I uh, just wanted to quickly plus one Rowan as well, um, with my with not my chair hat on. Um, I did feel like parts of the architecture doc document could be clear in saying that this is what is okay and this is what is not okay. And like the architecture document is a good place to do that. Um, so yeah, I think it'd be great if the document is more clear in what is you know outside the scope and inside scope. Thanks. Chris, Chris Patton, um, I got a little lost. Actually, I had like a similar question, but I, I got a little lost there. Um, so let me just ask Brandon, um, is there a core set of security and privacy requirements for which each of the deployment models are all isomorphic, basically? Uh, I believe so, yes. And that is currently written in the architecture document. Um, it says, when a user searches for a key, they're guaranteed to receive the same result that any other user searching for the same key would receive um, if the transparency log you know, doesn't do this correctly to give you a fake result, then either you detect that immediately and you reject what the transparency log said, or your client permanently enters an invalid state, which is detectable by out-of-band communication. So they're all supposed to be isomorphic with that as you have this transparency guarantee of, um, I see the same thing as everyone else. If I don't see the same thing as everyone else, either I immediately notice or I eventually notice. So do we expect different deployments? Like, do we expect a third party audited one versus a 30 party managed one to have different uh, privacy properties you can get? Like if you, if you choose one over the model over the other, uh, what's the advantage beyond operational considerations? Um, that is a great question. My immediate thought is that the two third party modes are gonna be the same in terms of privacy with the third party. So you're gonna leak the same information to the third party no matter what, but it's just uh, operationally maybe nicer to integrate the third party in different ways. Cool, cool. Um, and then back, my, my initial question is, are we designing one protocol that will work for all deployment models or do we want to have uh, one, one protocol per deployment model? Do you have, an, yes. do you have a vision there yet? Or? The vision is to have one protocol that can do all three. Awesome, that's great, thanks. Hi, Phil Han Baker. Uh, yeah, I'm following this. Um, there might be some simplifying assumptions that could be taken. I did try to formalize this type of area about six years ago now. And I think that the key thing that you need to look at is work factor. 
only what you get here is a different type of work factor than the typical computational work factor we're used to. Because the magical thing that happens when you put something into a notary log is that the work factor for forging that particular assertion goes from essentially zero to infinity at the time that you put it into the log. If you have an assertion saying Obama's public key is X, signed yesterday, it means nothing. If you have that assertion signed when he was a Harvard student, that's actually quite useful data because somebody would have to have either anticipated the value of that attack or found a time machine. And so if you're looking to formalize, I think that that's a productive method. Uh, it doesn't necessarily, I mean, th there's a slight weirdness in this group in that we're talking about a particular technology that's really general. Sticking stuff into notary logs is really useful, but we're only looking at it for validating keys. And that might be skewing our analysis somewhat. If we st take the two things apart and say, what are the properties of notary logs here and how do they apply to keys over here, I think that you'll find it more productive. The other point I'd make is that there is only one notary ch chain and it's not a chain, it's a lattice. Because in my system, every single user maintains their own notary chain. Every service maintains their own notary chain. They cross notarize. Now, if you look at the constraints on that, it's a lattice in that each chain can link to any other chain. And when you think about the uh, properties of that, you know, everything is eventually going to link to everything because a connected graph is always going to be more powerful. So the graph is going to connect. The only question is going to be whether you use the fact it's connected or not. And then when you're trying to analyze whether this particular assertion was made in this particular time interval, i.e. after this date and before this date, you can set up a situation where the you're essentially just analyzing that relative to one chosen notary log. And if that is your own notary log that you maintain, the ultimate source of authority for that is yourself. And so there are some very powerful statements here, but you're probably not going to get them to work in Tamarin as it is currently configured because it's really 90 degrees to what it's designed to do at the moment. Um, Siobhan, my co-chair. Yes. Yeah. Just wondering, Brendan, did you want to finish your presentation first? Um, or do you think it's worthwhile just having this discussion right now? And to everyone in the queue, we will get to um, the question of should we adopt this document uh, after Brendan's presentation is over? And then we have two presentations on the security and privacy properties of key transparency. Um, but yeah, just leaving it up to you, Brendan, if you want to take all the questions right now, or do you want to finish your presentation first? Um, unless we're pressed for time, I would keep going now because it's a conversation in a few slides that I want to frame pretty clearly. So, so keep going with the presentation and then do the questions at the end. I do the questions now or finish the okay, queue now. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. We'll continue to process the queue. Uh, Kevin, you're up. Um. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. Cool. Um. Right. I just want to comment. I think um, there are a lot of really good you know, questions coming about the security and privacy properties. And I hope we, that we will cover them in the next few presentations, because personally, I think there's a lot of nuance behind it. And although it may not be currently reflected in the architecture document, I think at the very least, we can start having some of these discussions and having like a structured way to think about these different properties. And then the comment that I originally wanted to make was about um, the linearizable view side. I think that's one thing which I'm hoping that maybe we could relax that requirement to some extent because the implication of requiring um, clients to store some amount of state, maybe some applications can deal with that. But like, for example, in WhatsApp, we decided explicitly not to do that because like 
when users have multiple devices, if you like check for the latest date on one device, how do you sync that with your other devices? Um, and especially if that like um, implies like if, if you like forget to do the check, then it has some security implication, then that ends up being like not a great thing to rely on. So just going back to, I guess, the question of like, are we going for a single deployment that works for everyone? I think it's going to be hard to do that just because different products have different requirements. And if there could be some flexibility in like deployments that are, can allow for clients to remember state and deployments where they can. Yeah, I should say that you don't have to synchronize the linearizable view between all of the devices that a client has. Like each, de each device can maintain its own view separately. Um, I think we can take that offline. Stephen. Hi, Stephen Farrell. Uh, so we have kind of history of kind of key servers that go bad in various ways. So we have kind of history of key servers that can go bad in various ways. Maybe in this case, there's new ways because they're producing proofs as well as uh, answering questions. Is there a kind of a vision or plan or something in the architecture document that, that kind of says when that happens, how do the users get back to working again? Uh, there is not something. That's actually um, something that I thought about earlier is we need to add a section to the architecture draft on lifecycle management. So. so yeah, so I think that would be a good thing. I mean, because there is history of key servers that go away or become unresponsive or get full of crap. Or in this case, there's new cryptographic ways they can fail. Um, so having some model, I don't know if it affects the protocol. It might, it might affect how you do federation, but I think having some vision for how a gazillion users can stop using one thing and start using another would be good because it does happen, I think. Yeah, that's a great comment. Jonathan. Uh, good morning. Can you hear me? We can. Um, so I was wondering if we have a, a backup. Um, so if there's some content that is legally required to be removed from the tree, right? Like somebody has decided, uh, some court has said, you know, this is copyrighted content, uh, or, or sorry, this is a, this account is copyrighted. Um, so it's sharing copyrighted content, so you've got to remove it. Is there a way for us to occlude something from the tree other than throw away the whole tree and create a new one without that account in it? Um, well, the, the beautiful thing about this being an architecture document instead of a protocol document is that I can basically assert that there needs to be one without describing how to do it. And um, but is is that is that in scope? Is there a is, are we going to yeah. say there is a way of removing something from the tree without breaking all the proofs? Um, yes, that's text that needs to be added. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just interrupt. Yeah. There was some discussion on the list around, uh, you know, compliance requirements around removing information from logs. So you, you may want to review some of the discussions on the list if you're interested in that topic. All right. I think we've drained the queue. Brandon? Great. Okay. So the, the second section of my talk is feedback from the mailing list. Kind of go over what, um, what we were told there. Um, so most of the feedback that we got from the list is actually about text that was missing that people want added. Um, one that I thought of myself earlier is that we probably need support for a uh, sealed sender type mode. So uh, some into encrypted applications have support for what's called sealed sender, which is basically a way for people to communicate anonymously. So um, with the key value abstraction that we've talked about so far, you have to log in as one user and then you have to look up the public key of another user. And uh, like we just talked about in the queue, uh, that leaks the social graph, which can be potentially um, sensitive. So we should uh, write additional text describing how KT, uh, how you would potentially deploy KT in that scenario. Um, other text to be added is the, uh, the lifecycle management, which was mentioned earlier. Um, so like if a log, Dies, or if you just want to create a new log because you don't like the old one, you need some secure way to migrate from the old one to the new one. Uh, we also need to add text on how federation would work, as well as uh, on privacy law compliance or the compelled deletion of user data. So if we get um, 
like a request saying that some user needs to be deleted. You need to be able to handle that without destroying everything. Um, so that's missing text. The one of the substantive questions that came up on the mailing list was about immediate updates. Uh, so currently the draft says that requested changes are applied to the log immediately. And really what that means is that we would not provide or what that means is that the protocol we write would have no way to provide basically interim inclusion proofs, um, kind of like an SET, if you're familiar with certificate transparency. Uh, and the reason that we would not do that is primarily because it would simplify the protocol if you don't have to standardize two types of proof for everything where one type is subtly less secure than the other one. Um, and it also supports deployments that want uh, a very strict KT regimen where they only want the stronger type of proof. They don't want to deal with the weaker type of proof like an SCT um, versus an actual inclusion proof in SCT log. Um, so my understanding is that the argument in favor of having interim inclusion proofs usually comes from a concern that a KT server is not fast enough or reliable enough for the broader application. And so people don't want to risk causing an outage because the KT server maybe isn't sequencing changes quickly enough. So they want to be able to produce like a signed promise or something. Uh, but functionally what a signed promise is, is just delaying full verification. And if KT reliability is a concern for a specific application, I think that application can probably implement KT in a way that um, delays verification without that needing to be a core part of the protocol. Um, so like if you're expecting a proof to be somewhere and it's not, and you're not an application that follows a strict KT sort of mm -hmm. regimen, you can keep using the public key immediately anyways, and you can, um, and you can like go back and check for the proof in an hour or something, um, if that makes sense, right? Like we can design a protocol that is very secure and provides very strong guarantees. Um, and then people can implement it as loosely as they they need to, right? Like um, so that if proofs fail to verify or something that is you know, ignored or delayed or retried later. Um, but yeah, that's the core idea. That's, um, this is actually my last slide. So that's the question I had because this is um, the little substance of feedback we got on the list. I wanted to ask for people's opinions on this as well. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, based on what we've seen so far, um, would anyone like to come to the mic and uh, express their views you know, regarding this particular document? Do you have any objections to the document in its current form? Let's see, Daniel. So I'll comment maybe just on the, the last slide and question. Um, it's my understanding, or so maybe for background, uh, I'm Daniel Heichel from Proton. We are deploying a version of key transparency, not based on this document, but that we've been working on for a while, mostly based on Conix. And the, in our model, um, we, we do do um, sort of intermediate uh, proofs as I think you called it, um, or interim proof, sorry. And the, the reason is um, because, so in my mind, key transparency is anyway a detection only mechanism, right? Not, it doesn't prevent um, a server from uh, serving malicious keys. It just allows um, the, the user who owns the keys to detect it later. Right, so yeah. even if you do this, uh, or even if you don't do this, that's still possible, I would say, because um, e even if the key is in key transparency, the owner of the key might not have checked it yet. Um, so you might as well um, do an interim proof and use it immediately. But I, I see your point that maybe that doesn't need to be specified explicitly in the document and can just be done by an application. Um, but yeah, that's my 
impact you? Yeah, the thought is more so that uh, most KT implementations today, I think, are actually capable of integrating new entries really quickly. And the fact that they are capable of integrating new entries really quickly um, sort of obviates the need for uh, like an interim proof where I'll give you like a an SCT really quickly and then I'll give myself like 24 hours to actually update the tree. That's just kind of not necessary. Um, Thanks. Is anyone opposed uh, to adopting this document? Would you like to come to the mic to state the reasons why? Um, just for context, this is uh, this document is our first deliverable, um, or we do plan to adopt a document around architecture. So, um, if you don't think this document is ready for adoption, please um, say so now because we will be holding an adoption call for it. But that is at least the plan, unless we hear objections otherwise, because the chairs think that so far um, from the discussion, it seems like there's generally positive feelings towards adopting it. Daniel Gilmore just wanted to say, I support adoption of the document. Thanks for working on it. Thank you. Rowan. Yeah, uh, I support adoption. And the thing that I said in my previous comment at the microphone, I think we want to do that at the same time as adoption and not wait until after it's adopted. Also just wanted to add that I'm also in favor of adoption and thanks for working on this. I think it's, it's great to have a, a standardized version of this instead of like everyone, including us doing their own thing and uh, also uh, perhaps for the benefit of OpenBGP, it would be great to uh, have something like this standardized as well that um, we could potentially make use of um, for, you know, open BGP key, key servers as well and, and so on. So yeah, thanks for working on this. Roman Tineja, sorry, I couldn't find the button on my screen. Rohan, can you clarify what you meant? So you're supporting adoption, but not in its current form until we adjudicate what you said, or are you saying we should adopt it and then immediately make sure we've worked on what you described? I couldn't tell which one. Uh, I, I would feel more comfortable if somebody, you know, Brendan, somebody else took a stab at at least saying, okay, here's a straw person set of, uh, set of the requirements that you're trying to address in Keytrans um, and put it in this document or wrote it in another document. Does that make sense? You know, simultaneously with adoption, but you know, that there is, that there is some text that people can say, I agree or don't agree with and not wait until later. But, uh, but it, just to clarify, not the text in the current document, additional text in the current document prior to adoption. Additional text in the current document, you know, as the document is adopted. <laughs> Rich, Rich, I'll let you yeah. go Rich ahead. Rich Zuckerman, it's instantaneous, it's like a quantum event. It's either... It's, yeah. Adoption is instantaneous. It's a quantum event. It either happens or it doesn't. So you can say, I would like something to change before we adopt it. I want to see what happens. Um, or let's ado it's adopted, and then we can work on it. The other secondary, well, the other key point is adoption means we start work on it as a group, not it's almost done. Let's stamp it. Thank you. Uh, in, in my experience, adoption is not a quantum event. It's usually something that happens on the mailing list over a, over a period of a week. So it can be addressed during the, the period of that week with the assumption that we are going forward with adoption unless there's, you know, objection on the mailing list. Does that make more sense? Yeah, but that means in the general terminology, you want it changed before the adoption call is made. That's my understanding as well. So, so we'll need to take uh, this conversation to the list regardless. Um, and then of course, uh, as, as is the case for all IETF business, it will happen on the list. So you'll have a chance to, to give those comments um, there. Uh, let's, Felix. 
please. Yeah, hi, thanks. I, I wanted to discuss the requirements um, that Rowan brought up. I, I wonder what you're missing because there are four requirements that Brenton laid out in the beginning in the charter, right? And one of the doc and one of the requirements is private. And I think even the objections that have been made towards, oh, maybe we want to also protect who is looking up something. I, I mean, that makes sense, but I think this is in scope of what is written in the charter. So I find the um, requirements nicely specific and broad at the same time. Um, and I find them sufficient to like later say, as you pointed out, oh, this is what we want, right? So that we can ref refer to them. Thank you. Simon. Morning, Simon Friedberger, Mozilla. I just wanted to pitch in with Rohan. I think, I think there should be uh, clarifications on what the privacy requirements are because what DKG said is pretty obviously a privacy requirement, but also in previous deployments, people would cross sign keys, which leaks social graphs. So what do we put in? What are the uh, specific guarantees that people and service operators get and don't get? That should be in the document. Thank you. Hannes. Yeah, I've read the document. I think it's great you should adopt it. Uh, and, and of course, there will be further discussions and text edit later on, like always. Thank you. All right, it seems we've drained the queue. Siobhan, do you have any comments? Um, I think, yeah, I think maybe, uh, or you and I should talk with Brendan and um, see if there's something like a set of, you know, text updates we can do that and surface that to the list. Um, and then, uh, you know, then do an adoption call uh, right after. Because it did seem like a couple of people thought that there's a, a few things that I'd like to see added to the security and privacy sections. Brandon, do you want, want to ask any questions while we have folks in the room here, or do you want to just take that to the list? I think I'm going to take it to the list, yeah. All right. Cool. Thanks all. Um, that is pretty helpful. So yeah, uh, I think we're ready to move on to the, to the last presentations. Thank you, Brandon. Awesome. Uh, welcome, Esha. Your video is coming through. You're welcome to proceed at any point. Yeah, thanks, Ori. Can you hear me okay? Be a little bit louder. Okay, I'll try to speak louder, better. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, so we did, I'm getting a bit of an echo. I, can you hear me okay? We can hear you fine here, I think. Uh, okay, so I wanted to talk about some of the security. So there were already some great discussion about the security and privacy requirements of a K-transparency system. And uh, Kevin will talk about the privacy requirements later. So in this presentation, I wanted to surface some of the dimensions of security properties that we might be considering for KT. So like Brendan already covered, and so this is just a very quick recap that in key transparency systems, the service provider maintains a directory of some user identifier to the public key mappings. And the way users interact with the directory service is by uh, three ways. So either it does a search or a lookup for its own key or for some other user's key. It can update its own contact and it can also monitor and audit the log, the transparency log for consistency. And roughly speaking, the service provider for the any protocol that has been considered is where the service provider builds a tree, some sort of tree, Merkle-like tree, and the tree head and posts a tree head per epoch. Uh, and each of the clients, when they look up a key, Along with the key, they get a cryptographic proof of correctness 
from the service provider and that they can verify against the latest uh, tree hash produced. And if the proofs do not check out, it raises an error. Okay. Sorry, I'm getting a lot of echo. I'll try to rejoin. Sir? No, just just continue talking, please, Asha. Okay. Uh, you can you can take your headset off while you speak. And yeah. If you, we can hear you though. Is this better? It's, it's fine for us, but you won't be able to hear this, maybe. <laughs> okay. Okay, it's better for me. All right. Okay, so roughly speaking, the security properties are along two dimensions, and I want to see if there's agreement on that. So one is the correctness property, and this was in Brendan's uh, draft already, which we, I would say is when the log operator is behaving honestly, what properties we expect from the KT system. And then the second property, which we would call consistency property, is what properties we would expect when the operator is potentially malicious. So the correctness properties, I think, are somewhat more straightforward, which is when a user looks up their own key, the result they receive uh, should be the same as the result that any other user searching for the key should uh, would get. And the second is when a user modifies their own key, the other users will see this modification the next time they search for the key. Oh, there's a corner. So I'm checking to see if there's a, anyone in the bridge who needs to be muted, but I don't see any open microphones. So um, the headset may be uh, closed, so you can move, perhaps move the headset. I moved it, yeah, I switched it off. Awesome. You proceed whenever perfect? you like. We can still hear you here. Okay. Okay, and then for the consistency properties, I think at a high level, what we would expect is that when when a malicious uh, service provider log operator doesn't follow the correctness properties, they should be detectable. So at a very high level, when a user looks up a key and the result they receive is not the same as the result that any other user searching for the same key would, it will be detected. And likewise, when a user modifies a key, but that the change is not reflected and the other users don't say it, that should also be reflected, but uh, detected. But I think these are very high level consistency properties and there are a lot of uh, subtle dimensions of it that some of it already came up in the discussion before. So I would try to give a quick summary of the dimensions that I think are interesting and we should be considering. Uh, so here are some of the list listings of it and I will go over it one by one. Uh, so what the first is dissemination of tree heads. The second is what state the clients need to keep. Uh, these, these were already discussed. Some of the other things that were not discussed is when the inconsistency should be detected and by who. And there are uh, two other things of third party auditing and owner signing, which provides a slightly stronger consistency property. So the goal of this presentation is to just surface up these dimensions and discuss and see what seems to be the reasonable set of requirements. So the first point that came up and Brendan did a bunch of discussion on this is uh, the dissemination of tree heads. And this is basically that all the users should see the same tree head for the same epoch. And this is important for detecting inconsistency. Otherwise the server can fork the view, keep two different tree heads to the owner of the key and the recipient uh, and thus get away. Uh, so there, are, there was gossip was already discussed a bunch. So one way to disseminate these tree heads among the users are through gossip. Uh, but there's also another mechanism, which is a third party bulletin board where the server could uh, post these tree heads on a third party bulletin board where the clients could consume it from. So there are two possible options that I wanted to surface up here. And the second, dimension that I wanted to talk about is the state. So what state the clients need to keep for uh, consistency to work or for inconsistency in KT system to be detected. So the first part of it is the key owner state. So let's say the key owner, Bob, first thing to notice here is that only the key owner will be able to authoritatively decide 
if a key distributed on their behalf was a fake key. So for this, Bob has to look up their key history, the key history the service provider is maintaining. And each time Bob changes his key, he has to check that the change was correctly reflected in the log. So these are some assumptions on the state of the key owner. And it's also required that Bob actually remembers the epochs at which he changed or updated his key. So those are a set of uh, requirements that the current KD system, almost all KD systems have on the key owner state. So one question is, is this a reasonable set of assumptions? Can we weaken this or, or is it just reasonable and we should make it a requirement? Another uh, dimension of con state that I wanted to bring up is contact state. So it's not the key owner state itself, but the key owner may also require to keep some state for other users or for its contacts for an inconsistency to be detectable. And some KT systems that are pr proposed in the literature actually have this property. And in this example, for example, if Alice is receiving Bob's key, Alice might need to remember the last key she has seen for Bob or the version number or possibly some more auxiliary information for the inconsistency to be detected. Again, this is a question of, is this a reasonable assumption? Does it make sense? So that's another dimension. And the third thing to talk about is who detects the inconsistency and exactly when. Uh, so again, something to note is that at least two checks need to happen when a fake key is distributed on an owner's behalf. So in our toy example, say Bob is the owner, Alice is the receiver of the key. So Alice first needs to, at least needs to check that the key she received for Bob is actually logged in the tree head. And when Bob comes back online, he needs to see this fake key that was distributed on his behalf to be also logged in the tree. So at least these two checks need to happen for an inconsistency, inconsistency to be detectable. And there are two ways an, inc an inconsistency can be detected. So one is immediate in the sense that whenever Bob comes next after the fake key distribution happens and does a key monitoring, he immediately detects that there was something wrong, that the fake key was distributed. But there's another uh, weaker version of inconsistency detection where Bob cannot actually immediately detect it after he comes back online. Additional need, uh, checks needs to happen by Alice or possibly by other users for this inconsistency to be detected. And there are proposals in the literature that achieve this weaker consistency property. Okay. Okay. And then the other thing to talk about is the third party auditing. So Brendan already talked a bunch about this and this other deployment modes. So what I wanted to talk here is the, the notion of third party auditing from the lens of consistency checks. So third party auditor is expected to download and authenticate the logs content, and they are trusted to run this correctly and attest to the result. But something I would like to note here is the third party auditing is added for efficiency. So if it's not a trust issue and it's not a concern for uh, consistency since the clients, if they do not want to trust a third party auditor, they can also download this audit proofs and check it themselves. Uh, and finally, the last property uh, to bring up is owner signing. Uh, so some of these KD systems have some version of it, which is that a device, a user, there's a, either a user level key or the device level keys that are required to sign the next update. Uh, when the user adds a, rotates a key or adds a new device, they're required to sign that update. And that gives a slightly stronger consistency property in that if a malicious server published a tree head at a certain time and a certain user's device got compromised sometime after that, even then the client who holds that tree head will not accept any keys uh, that the user's device did not actually authorize before it got corrupted. So it gives slightly stronger uh, consistency and there are systems that also achieve that. So, that's my talk and basic takeaways, but just I wanted to surface up the different cyber, subtle security different, uh, dimensions. Maybe it would be great to discuss what would be a desirable set of properties. And all of this provides, this combination of these things provide various trade offs. And that's, I think, would be interesting to discuss. Too. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.
wonderful presentation. Any questions? There's none in the room. Seems we've had a lively uh, chat uh, discussion as well. Is there anything from the chat that should be surfaced to the microphone or to the rest of the group? All right, thank you. All right. Excellent. We can hear you. We have your slides. Go ahead when you're ready. Thanks. Um, I think there is some echo. So I'm going to like turn down the volume on this app. And if you need to tell me to stop or something, just like wave your hands <laughs> in case I can't wait. Can anyway. You. Awesome. Okay. Cool. So, hi everyone. I'm Kevin. Um, I'm going to be talking about the privacy properties for key transparency. Um, and similar to Isha's talk, I'm, this is really meant to be kind of like an overview or maybe like a, like here are some like interesting things that we should probably discuss about privacy, um, not necessarily like strict recommendations of we should do this, we shouldn't do this, because I think there's a lot of nuance behind these um, topics. And so I hope that at the very least, and thank you everyone for joining for this live discussion. I think it's been really great to, to hear what, what people's concerns are in terms of privacy, which we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, okay, so let me get into it. Um, so yeah, for, for this talk here, the, here's a brief outline of the topics I'll be covering. Um, first I'll start off just with a recap and the motivation, um, around the architecture around key transparency and why actually I think we should be extra, extra careful in coming up with design for key transparency that respects user privacy. Um, then I'll go over some common examples of how Merkle trees and VRFs, which stand for verifiable random functions. Um, can be good for privacy, but still might not cover the complete story that we want for key transparency. Um, and this is going to be related to also how there can inherently be a trade-off between privacy and performance or efficiency for the, for the various designs that we consider for key transparency. And then finally, I'll cover some challenges that we should think about as a group regarding user data deletion and retention, because that's also something that came up in the mailing list. All right. So yeah, as Brendan covered and issue reviewed as well. Um, basically, so in key transparency, we're kind of assuming that there is some service provider. This service provider has some database that maps user identifiers, which can be like phone numbers or email addresses to the user's public keys that are typically used for say key exchange in an end-to-end encrypted messaging app, right? And the basic operations that this service provider supports for the user are one being able to add a new to, to, to be able to add a new entry or update an existing entry in the database, and this is you know typically corresponding to you can imagine the user adding a new device to their account. Um, two, search and lookup, which is um, when a user wants to look up an entry in the database, the server checks first that they have the permission to do so, and then returns this entry to the user along with some sort of like proof of inclusion that this is actually the entry in the database and this is the unique entry in the database. And then finally, there's like a monitor or an audit operation in which a user can do a mix of either checking the history of updates to their own entry and making sure that the server has been representing them properly, as well as checking that the service provider has been operating honestly by not trying to rewrite history or like deleting old entries, um, for instance. And for each of these operations, I want to emphasize that um, the service provider can always run their own access control checks, for instance, to make sure that like a user is monitoring their own data and so that an adversary can't just start trying every possible phone number querying the server to see if it's been registered in the database, um, right? Because like kind of like the, 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 the focus for privacy here is the server has this like high value database of all of the user identifiers that have been registered with the service. And if this were just to be made public, like today when there's no key transparency, this is like kept strictly server side usually. And in key transparency, we're kind of like making some portions of this or like inclusion proof space off of this public. And what we want to be really, really careful about is that we're not starting to leak the social graph or we're not starting to leak 
um, any like information about how often users are updating their keys. And, and I'll, I'll go into some examples of where I think we could potentially fall into these kinds of dangers with specific design choices. Um, yeah. Okay. And I, I guess another thing I want to just to simplify the examples here, I'm going to be assuming that in this key transparency design that we're talking about, there's the database for the service provider, and it's represented by, let's say, like a single gigantic Merkle tree. Um, since this is predominantly the kind of structure that exists uh, for most proposals um, for KC out there. Okay, so um, the first example of a potential like privacy leakage has to do with the serving of these proofs of inclusion um, that a service provider sends to users when they look up their own entry, right? So let's say that a user wants to get the latest entry corresponding to their own identifier um, and a service gives back the entry along with some inclusion proof. Um, the way that this is structured is that we find the node in the tree um, corresponding to this entry, and then we return the list of its sibling nodes along the path to the root as this proof. And now immediately, just based off of the number of nodes that's contained in this proof, that already reveals like the approximate height of the tree. And this means that someone who is able to collect a bunch of these inclusion proofs and observe changes to their size over time can already get like a rough estimate of how many users are being added to the tree over a long period of time. And now you might say technically this isn't so bad because like the way these Merkle trees work is that when the tree grows really large, the height changes exponentially less and less frequently. Um, so an adversary, you know, when the tree already has like say millions or billions of nodes might not be able to observe these deltas over time. Um, but this is just to illustrate an example of, you know, some amount of privacy leakage and how we should probably be careful when we're designing the schemes that we're aware of exactly what we are leaking every time we're getting out these inclusion proofs or serving user queries in general and acknowledging that it isn't too much. Um, a more serious privacy issue is that actually these inclusion proofs also leak the neighboring leaf nodes in the Merkle tree, meaning that if we just issue like a plain inclusion proof, um, users not only get to see their own value, but then like the hash of the value belonging to any node that is like positioned next to them in the Merkle tree, right? Um, and this particular problem can be ad addressed to some extent with the use of verifiable random functions, which kind of like randomize the location of these nodes so that these inclusion proofs just reveal that there's some neighboring node and not like a node associated with a particular user. And this is something that we'll talk about later when we're talking about mitigating some of these privacy issues. Okay, so example two, um, I want to talk about with regards to how we plan to deal with repeated uh, with repeated updates to the same entry. So for instance, let's say that a user um, is updating their entry five times in a row, right? Um, is it revealed based on our design to other people in the system that there's been some user that's been updating their entry five times repeatedly? Or does it look indistinguishable from the case that like five different people updated their key five times? And this is kind of like a subtle issue that crops up when we're talking about how we handle version updates for nodes in the Merkle tree. You know, do we keep modifying the same node in the tree, thereby leaking this information? Or do we hide it by maybe like creating five brand new nodes in the tree instead each time the update happens? Um, and this by itself might not seem like such a big deal to leak. But in aggregate, and depending on how publicly available this information is to glean, you know, people might be able to start collecting these high-level statistics about user behavior in the system, like you know, producing like these frequency distributions of, oh, this this particular user, although they may not know like which user it is, it's updating their entry every epoch or something. And and that in, in general could I, I guess it's not clear if that's something we want to protect. Maybe there are some deployments which care about this property and, and don't want to leak that information. Maybe there are others um, which do not care about this property and would be okay to leak it. And the reason why I think that to some extent, this is a good discussion to have early, in addition to the points that were mentioned before, is that this can really affect the design um, and the performance of the system. So the choice of whether or not we um, keep adding new nodes every time an entry is updated versus just recycling the old ones um, can have, I guess, like a large impact and it'd be good if we addressed it earlier. Oops, I skipped a slide. Okay, so for the third example, I wanted to talk about 
leaking past update history when user identifiers get reused. So this I haven't seen discussed too much yet, but um, for instance, popular messenger apps like Signal and WhatsApp rely on phone number as the primary identifier for users, right? Um, and one kind of like issue with phone numbers is that they're often recycled, meaning that you know you can own a phone number and then your telecom service provider might decide to assign it to a different person after you've like given up their phone number. And in key transparency, we're likely going to be supporting operations where a user can get the entire history of key changes for their own identifier, or at least history up to some point. So does this mean that should that they should be able to look arbitrarily far into the past to see all the updates that have been made for every user that has owned their particular phone number? Or perhaps can there be some way to like limit this information? Um, maybe when a user explicitly, like I don't, th th this is I think in general challenging to address, but um, if a user has explicitly said, I'm recycling this, you know, I, I'm giving up this phone number, they can make the service provider not reveal any history of how often the keys been updating or any usage patterns to the next users of that phone number. Um, and then for the fourth example, um, so the first two examples were more about how does the service provider keep private information about the database without leaking um, this information to users who are querying. And for the fourth example, I just want to briefly touch up, uh, upon also that um, when clients make queries, the service provider is inherently learning information about the client behavior here. Um, so for instance, if um, clients are asking to look up a, a specific key very frequently, then the service provider can technically see this and they might learn some information like this user is very popular, right? And to some extent, this is kind of a privacy problem, even if you don't have key transparency, because the server is maintaining this database and can monitor how frequently certain entries in the database are being requested. Uh, but with key transparency, you know, we're also asking clients to query for their key update history. So we just want to make sure that, you know, to, that with whatever design we come up with for key transparency, we're not um, leaking more information that we than we intend to leak. Okay, so that was just kind of like a really fast overview of some examples for things that I think we should be probably thinking about in terms of um, privacy for key transparency designs. I'm going to switch over to talking quickly about um, the tools that have been discussed in the literature for addressing some of these problems these privacy leakage problems. So um, the first one that comes to mind, of course, is verifiable random functions, or VRFs. Um, and the way a VRF works uh, is basically there is uh, the service provider can pick some VRF key. And this is going to be a private key that's kept server side. And there is a function, let's say VRF, which takes the server key and a phone number or a user identifier and it outputs some random looking identifier along with a proof. And then there is a second function, VRF verify, which takes some public key associated with that server key, um, also the identifier or phone number, the random ID and the proof, and outputs true or false. And basically the point of this verification function is to say, okay, this random ID and this proof kind of prove that it's associated with this phone number. Um, and this isn't really like the most in-depth explanation, but basically the way that VRFs are used to preserve privacy and key transparency is that the position of the leak node, instead of using your raw phone number, um, what people do is they pass the phone number through the VRF and they use the random ID as output um, to determine the position of the leak node in the Merkle tree. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, the advantage to this is now, you know, when you give out these inclusion proofs, you're not directly leaking the values for the node next to you because that node next to you probably represents like a phone number that or, or some user identifier that like chronologically um, is associated with or, or like it is near your own identifier. And the point of the VRF is now we, we are kind of like positioning the, uh, these identifiers in random parts of the tree. Um, and this kind of technique for privacy preserving of these inclusion proofs was introduced in Conix. Um, back in 2015. Um, oops, sorry. Yes. Okay, so I did want to mention that there are some limitations, though, to the usage of VRFs. 
for solving these privacy problems. So for instance, things that aren't fully addressed are, for example, what happens when a user wants to update their value? You know, I, I mentioned this before, but should we keep modifying the existing entry or should we create new nodes? Uh, because even though you're using a VRF, if you keep modifying the existing entry, then technically someone can observe through these, through these inclusion proofs that, okay, I don't know who this node belongs to, but this person keeps updating their entry. And that's like some information that's being leaked. And one option that has also been suggested in the literature to address this specific issue is to, instead of just passing the phone number or the user identifier to the VRF, to also give it a version number. So now you pass the user identifier plus some version number um, to the VRF so that every time the identifier gets a new value, um, it actually corresponds to a completely different VRF output that isn't linkable to the old values. Um, and yeah, so, so this was kind of a privacy improvement that was introduced by the Seamless paper in 2019. And then I, I guess still, <laughs> like you might say that this is not enough because um, the server is still holding this VRF private key. And essentially all these techniques are predicated on the assumption that this private key is never leaked. But what happens if it does get leaked? Um, technically this means that now all these inclusion proofs can be like reverse engineered to figure out exactly what identifiers or like which positions in the tree these nodes were in. And so there is, I, I want to mention two kind of recent-ish works that have been um, thinking about basically what happens when we deal with privacy or like the, the security properties of the VRF itself. One is called rotatable zero knowledge sets. Um, where basically um, there is a way to be able to rotate this private key for the VRF without having to reconstruct the tree entirely. And I, I mentioned a, a link down here for post-quantum secure VRFs, not exactly related to um, leakage, but more about, you know, if we, so basically in the entire key transparency design, it's mainly based on hashing, constructing Merkle trees, which are post-quantum or quantum resistant. But the VRFs that we use are based on elliptic curves at the moment, and the, the most efficient ones are. And there's been some work recently to addressing this problem by introducing post-quantum VRFs. Okay, and then just checking on time. So this is kind of like a fun theoretical idea, but um, one kind of like very theoretical way to kind of get privacy um, instantly or, or like, complete privacy is to use like full zero knowledge proofs to hide information. And technically you can like write any kind of these statements in the form of zero knowledge proofs. And so there's these things called ZK snarks, which can be used uh, for these inclusion proofs, for dependent only proofs. But um, I think it's still an open research, it's still an open research question to see if this can actually be applied to like a real practical deployment. Hey, hey, um, I see there is a question. Feel free to interrupt me. Um, All right. Hey Kevin, nice to see you. Uh, this is Rowan. Um, on the previous slide, um, you mentioned uh, you know post quantum implications, uh, and could you please qu clarify for everybody that this is that this would would this need to be an active attack or is this something that could be uh, you know harvest I'm, now? I'm, I'm assuming this is not later. the harvest now decrypt later situation. That this is more like a post quantum signature issue that you would need to kind of be actively involved in order to subvert these, uh, to subvert that algorithm? Yeah, um, I think that's a good question. So ultimately it, it depends on how we plan to be publishing these proofs. So for instance, if we are taking all these proofs that involve the VRF outputs and putting them in some ledger that is available for forever, then that's kind of like the harvest now is already done. Um, and actually, yeah, I, I actually haven't thought too much about that question of what kind of damage could be done if we ha did have access to a quantum computer. But I think that's a, a great thing to certainly think about. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else wants to chime in with, with an answer to that. Um, I personally have not. Really thought Daniel. About it. This is Daniel Gilmore. Um, I don't have any concrete uh, proof of this, but it seems to me that if the secret key for the server is leaked by a quantum machine, that it would break these privacy guarantees. Like I, I, I think it is more of the, um, the, of the, like harvest now, decrypt later, sense. Like I think, I think if you if you were to take a copy of this log, which I think you could get, and then you were able to learn the secret keys, I think you would be able to re reverse engineer the identifiers from that information. 
So I do think it is, uh, I mean, it, the transparency properties would not be lost. It's the user ID privacy properties that would be lost. Right. Yeah, I would not be surprised if that were true. Awesome. Go ahead, Kevin. Okay, cool. So where was I? Oh, just two slides left. Yeah, okay. So ZK Starks, theoretically can be done, but probably not practical. Um, oh, yes, okay. So handling data deletion. So this I think is pretty important and I'm hoping that we can have more discussion about this in the, on the mailing list as well. So the Merkle tree nodes that, that we're using to construct the, or uh, that we're publishing along with these inclusion proofs, they correspond to hashes of user data. Um, and one kind of way in which we've proposed for handling data deletion, and to, to clarify what, what we mean by data deletion is when a user explicitly requests the service provider to like remove all information and forget that this user, user has ever registered or ever existed, right? And so one way in which we could conceive about handling this is to, you know, the tree just deals with the hashes of the user data. So let's just delete the raw user data and leave the hashes or like the remnants of the hashes in these inclusion proofs or something like that. And there is a question of, you know, does this suffice for actually doing the user data? Can the service provider um, actually like reverse engineer later on uh, these hashes? Um, and I think that's certainly something that we should continue discussing, but I also wanted to bring a couple more dimensions to this, which is one, you know, right now when we're talking about these transparency logs, usually we think of like these unbounded lists that keep growing and history is never deleted from. And maybe that because this is dealing with user data, you know, should service requires, should service require providers be required to complete this com complete history of all data updates? Because in some senses, this is like, if you register with a service like five years ago, and then you want to be forgotten, um, are you, should you be concerned that there's like the service provider that still has a hash or, you know, if the VRFT gets leaked or a post quantum, years, or, or a quantum, quantum adversary is able to reverse this, the VRF private key, then, you know, that might be something that maybe instead what we could do is allow service providers to like forget some history or like explicitly just delete this data. And there are different ways to approach this. One is to, for example, like just reset the tree. So like maybe the service provider has some policy for after two years where it's gonna clear all history and restart again. Um, now this has some issues with like what happens if you're caught among the boundary of like right before the reset and right after the reset. Um, but maybe there's some different, more like gradual ways in which we, we can relax that. So maybe instead of having a security property that you can view your entire history of, of all updates to this identifier forever, you have the key transparency guarantees for some period of time, let's say like two years, and then all older data kind of is forgotten or because it's not relevant to the user to check this, um, that might also be like kind of a, like a trade-off that you make for privacy. Um, I see there's a question on the mic. Go ahead. Honest. Yeah, I, I think you, you have to clarify the user data a little bit. In, here in this context, user data refers to the um, key, the, the username key identifier and the, the public key, not other user data, right? Yes, exactly, right. right. So, so I'm just talking about the user identifier and the public key, which may not seem like a big deal, but it's still like evidence that this user registered with the service provider. And that, that metadata, I, I would say, I guess, is something that um, we may want to protect or users may not be okay with having service providers store indefinitely. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, this is Daniel Khan Gilmore. So uh, with the certificate transparency logs, they don't have an infinite lifetime. Um, and I don't see why these should need to have an infinite lifetime either. We obviously can't uh, protect against somebody who copies the whole tree and keeps it around from keeping it. That's not something we can do. But I think the straightforward design is just that each tree has, you know, as, as part of the Merkle tree has a pointer to the previous one and you keep two trees around at all times or n trees around at all times if you wanna make it smoother. Um, and then when someone joins, you know, even if they join right on the cusp of a transition, their original action is from, you know, tree minus one, tree, you know, T minus one, and now there's tree T. And so you, you can keep the, you know, the window sort of grows and shrinks at the, at the epoch cadence of a transition between trees. And I, I think that's a reasonable thing to do because I don't think it's reasonable to ask uh, providers 
to commit to indefinitely growing storage. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, uh, watching this, it, I realized that uh, my mental model was uh, of what's being applied here is different. I suspect that there may be other people as well in that there are really two fundamentally different ways that you can a a approach this problem. And it's not clear to me that one is right and the other is wrong, but it is important that we understand which we're talking it. So the two ways are you can either take the data and compute, compute the data over the tree, over the data itself, or you can do the differences, which is what certificate transparency is doing. Certificate transparency is computing a chain over the incremental changes to the uh, certificate issuance. And which of the model you choose, you know, they both contain the same amount of data, but which one you choose is going to mean uh, you present more information to the outside world. So um, the other question that comes up is, what proof do you want to give from this tree and to whom? In that uh, what I would like to see is that when I connect to somebody else on Signal, uh, I see a little box saying, yes, this is Fred, and Fred's been on Signal now for six years. Now, that's something that I can then potentially verify myself using something in my client if it's a delta log. If it's a log over the del data, uh, maybe not, unless that tree is itself instantiated in a notary log somewhere. Um, so just a heads up that we need to be careful about which model we're talking about at which time, because uh, otherwise we're going to end up with a lot of confusion. Thanks. Got uh, three minutes left. Um, Kevin, you want to go ahead? Yeah, yeah. Um... I think I just have one slide left, but just for, for the last question, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I think, um, I, I'm not exactly sure I see functionally the difference between how those two different models would be implementing because we are taking snapshots every epoch. So the snapshots of the current state kind of, I think are equivalent to the incremental updates, but, but definitely like the, in, in terms of the um, supporting the functionality of like being able to see, oh, this is Fred and he's been on Signal for six years, that, you know, depending on how we design this, that may or may not be revealed. Um, and certainly something to consider, I think. Okay, sorry, let me just go to my last slide. So takeaways, um, basically, yeah, I, I hope to kind of illustrate the picture here of, you know, managing this kind of privacy leakage can be really tricky. There are a couple of examples that I brought up for how we might be potentially inadvertently leaking information if we choose certain designs. This is not necessarily an exhaustive list. Um, and I'm hoping that we can start thinking about these issues sooner rather than later because the designs that we end up choosing, we might, you know, do this kind of thing because it's more performant or more scalable, but it ends up uh, creating less nodes in the tree, but then less nodes in the tree means worse privacy or something like that. And so having these, at, at the very least, these requirements, uh, I think that Rohan was mentioning, um, would be really useful. Um, the second point I want to mention is that, yeah, I think in terms of like a good design, I would love to see like, we have like really good clarity around what exactly we are leaking, almost like provable guarantees. You know, like I, I, ideally we would say with this design, this inclusion proof will leak something and then nothing else. And the important part is the and nothing else so that we can like very clearly quantify, okay, if you get like thousands of these inclusion proofs, you won't really learn too much. Um, and then this kind of information can be presented to service providers should they choose to adopt um, one design over another, or, you know, we were talking about like third party auditing versus contract monitoring. Um, and yeah, I, I guess that was my third point. Basically, I think that depending on the requirements of the service provider, um, they can make different choices about what is okay or not okay to leak. And I still f hold some skepticism that we will be able to come up with one design that rules them all and has all the ideal properties because there's inherently trade offs between privacy and performance. Um, for key transparency and I'm hoping that at the very least we can have some flexibility in, our, in the designs, maybe like a more private version or a less private version, depending on the setting. 
Awesome. Thank you. So uh, we're basically at time here. Um, I'd like to thank all of the presenters. I think the presentations were excellent. Thank you to everyone who came to the mic to ask questions. And thank you to our note takers. And Roman, you no, I just want to reiterate what you just said. I, I think we just had a really great launch. So kind of thank you to all the proponents and the speakers to setting us on, on the right foot. Yep. And a special thanks to my co-chair, Siobhan, who's been making all of this super smooth. So thank you. You have any comments? I know. I think that went pretty well. Awesome. Thanks. And this will conclude our first session of Key Transparency. Thank you all for coming. See you next time.